Bentley and Slally had come to the end of the road. They stood for a moment in front of the broken stone wall. Slally shivered, and her hand gripped Bentley's as she looked up across the wind-blown grass of the meadow and saw what Bentley had just seen at the top of the cliff. Listen, he said, swallowing hard. Maybe you'd better wait here until... Slally shook her head. Bentley could see how frightened she was. But it wasn't the old fear of isolation within her silence. She had lifted her gaze to the top of the cliff again, and on her face Bentley saw the awe of the witness of the beholding squires, poets, lovers, and saints, of all the rememberers who had stood beside a thousand heroes at the place and hour of their destinies. The shining of the sun was so powerful that all Sally could see was the silhouette of the form Prince Umbra had assumed as he waited for Bentley at the top of the meadow. The hawks swooped down the grassy slope, whistling warnings as they came. They flew low beneath the trees where the children stood, shrilling loudly. Go away, Bentley yelled at them. Go home. The hawks rose into the bright air, dipping their wings in farewell, and disappeared over the eastern tree line. Bentley let go of Slally's hand. He took the stone out of his pocket and scrambled over the wall. The coarse grasses of the meadow brushed him chest high as he limped up the steep incline, his eyes fixed on the figure at the top. His heart was beating hard with the mortal apprehension of an eight-year-old boy with a warrior's exultation. As he toiled up the last fifteen feet with Slally behind him, Bentley tried, for one last time, to think of something he dreaded so much that the specter of it could paralyze him. He steeled himself to look Ombra in the face and throw the stone with all his strength and skill. The wind from the sea blew the hair out of his eyes as he got to the top of the cliff. He tasted salt and breathed the iodine aroma of kelp. He shifted the stone of raw to his right hand, his throwing hand. He heard slowly behind him gasp in astonishment. He saw Prince Umbra. He saw himself. Astonishment struck Bentley like a slap. He saw himself as a grown man, but not as he had imagined in his adulthood in his daydreams. Looking at the figure who sat gazing out to sea was like looking at a photograph in an old album where people were sealed in, in lost time forever. A tall, slender man in late middle age sat in profile on an old-fashioned wooden chair. His upper body was erect. His hands rested on a cane that stood before him. Bentley and Slally saw that he was unmistakably Bentley as he would be in, in uh, years and years in the future. The dark eyes, the nose, and the mouth were Bentley's. The swatch of brown hair that fell over one side of his forehead was streaked with gray. He was wearing a dark blue suit. A heavy gold watch chain was looped from one vest pocket to another. His black shoes were polished. A white handkerchief tucked into his breast pocket fluttered in the wind. Slowly, his head turned, and he looked at Bentley and Slally. In his eyes, there was the indelible sorrow of lost dreams. Good afternoon, he said, smiling a slight, sad smile. Bentley blinked, stunned by the sheer ordinariness of the shape Ombra had taken. Is it you, he whispered. The smile remained on the man's lips but the dullness in his eyes contradicted its amiability. No, he said, it's you. Bentley's heart was pounding. I thought you were going to be horrible, he said. I thought you were going to try to kill me. You may wish I had, his grown-up self answered. Bentley was stiff with amazement. A current of anxiety ran through him. He could feel the profound melancholy in the man who sat before him. There was menace within him, too. The adult Bentley Ellicott's eyes shifted to Slally. Some day, he said, you will understand why I don't stand up for you, he said. His voice was so controlled that it was brittle. His hands remained folded on the curved, curved top of the cane as he looked at Slally. I haven't forgotten, he said, his eyes narrowing. I don't forgive. He resumed his contemplation of the sea and the bright windy sky. Slally looked at Bentley. There was a bewildered expression on her face. I don't know what he's talking about, Bentley said. I don't know what it means. I just know it's me. He turned back to the man sitting on the wooden chair. The cane was black and had a silver band around its handle. Didn't you get your leg fixed? Bentley asked. For almost a minute, the adult Bentley Ellicott neither answered nor acknowledged that he heard. No, he finally said, so softly that he could hardly be heard. He looked at Bentley again. You're, what, ten? 
I'm eight, as I said. His grown-up self nodded. Yes, he said. I remember you now. He smiled again, but without kindness. You have a very vivid imagination. You aren't the best runner in the ma aren't you the best runner in the major leagues? Bentley flushed with embarrassment. I that's just And you're going to win the World Series all by yourself, aren't you? his middle aged self said. The smile was still on his face like a taunt. Remind me, who was that man, the one who tried to bean you when you were making that last home run? Bentley's embarrassment was turning into humiliation. He felt especially foolish because Slowly was listening. He began to get mad. The pitcher, the middle-aged man prompted. The one from Arkansas. Cannonball Jones, Bentley muttered. The adult raised his face into the sunlight and laughed. That's it, Cannonball Jones. I'd forgotten the name I made up for him. He stopped laughing abruptly. His head came down and he looked back out at the sea. The wind fluttered in Bentley's ears. The hissing of the waves as they receded from the rocks at the foot of the cliff sounded like the warning of a serpent hidden somewhere nearby. I'm supposed to fight you, Bentley blurted. That's what they told... Don't be a fool, the middle-aged man said. Make believe time is over. You were sent here to face the facts of life. You're becoming me. Only the ugly kernel of you remains in me, thank God. I never did anything to you, Bentley said. He was getting scared, but he was still angry. I never even saw you before. He reminded himself forcibly that it was really Prince Ombra who was sitting on the wooden chair. But Ombra had turned himself into Bentley's future. Years and years of Bentley's life were in him. Lord of Nightmares was still himself, but he was also a middle-aged man named Bentley Ellicott, sitting on the top of a cliff. Slowly, the phantom of the future turned his head toward his boyhood. You never did anything to me. He said, his eyes uh, dull, his dull eyes suddenly full of fury. You've haunted my life. It takes years to root out and confront the tyrannical child who is in us all. Most people never do. I did. You ruined my young manhood. I couldn't, Bentley shot back angrily. I was you. The burning eyes stared into him. Yes, you were me. I carried you and what you did inside me across the years, burying the memory and the guilt under a layer of new illusions, new dreams and absurdities. The eyes darted slowly. You couldn't understand, could you? She never did anything to you either, Bentley said. The gusting wind blew the middle-aged man's hair into a disorderly scatter across his forehead. Do you, know, do you want to know about her? he asked Bentley. Bentley suddenly felt as if he were trapped in a nightmare. The dreamer knows he cannot avoid what is going to happen, but he tries desperately. Did Slally get to talk? he asked. The grown-up nodded. Yes, she talked. Is she okay? Bentley asked, trying to turn the conversation to ordinary things so that the nightmare wouldn't come to its climax. The adult Bentley Ellicott stood up, pushed his hair to one side. He turned back to the sea and sky, leaning on the cane. Her father died, he said, as if he were speaking to the wind. She inherited a lot of money. His eyes glittered. She didn't need me anymore. She left me. Bentley glanced at Slowly. She was horrified. She shook her head hard. Not that she got to spend much of her money, the middle-aged man said. There was a look of bitter amusement on his face. Poor Ellen. She never got over what happened between her and my father. She hated men for the rest of her life. Ellen decided that Rupert Drake had insulted her by leaving her out of his will. She hired lawyers, and they went after Slally and her lawyers like a war between cannibals. Those two women fought each other in the courts for seven... Ellen wouldn't do that, Bentley said. The grown-up turned to face him. Again, the graying hair blew across his forehead. He looked at Bentley, as if he loathed his childhood more than anything in the world. And if Slally left, it wasn't because she got a lot of money, Bentley yelled. It was because you... He stopped in mid-shout, as, in his mind, time uh, that is became time that will be. He stared at his future self. The slenderness seemed gaunt. The skin pallor bespoke of an illness that would never go away. Beneath the wind-scattered hair, the eyes of the grown-up Bentley Ellicott were bright with cruelty. If Slally left, Bentley whispered, it's because I'm going to do something bad to her. The grown-up's smile became a grin. Now you get it his metallic voice replied. You've already done bad things to her. 
McGraw told Ellen and my father about how you made her break into that hotel with you. Ellen thought you were a bad influence on Slally. That's what she and my father were fighting about the night of the storm. About me? You were also the reason for their last fight, his adult self went on. Ellen loved my dad, but she decided she had to get Slally away from you after you made her run away, and she was nearly killed by Charlie Phoebe. I tried to sneak off without her, Bentley cried. I didn't want her to come. Slally grabbed Bentley's arm. He couldn't bear to look at her. The middle-aged man had already persuaded Bentley that he had stumbled through his days smashing up the lives of the people he loved, never understanding what was going on around him. That revelation made him feel so ugly and stupid that his first impulse was to deny it. You're a liar! The gaunt man beside the wooden chair glanced at Slally. Maybe you'd like to tell him the truth, he said. Speak! Slally's grip constricted on Bentley's arm. He felt her tremble. The adult looked back at Bentley. If she had, hadn't been your friend, Ombra would never have used Steve Slattery to silence her. If you hadn't been so scared, you would have met Ombra long before that. Bentley's heart cried out to him to fight back, that this was a moment for which, the moment for which he had been born. But he didn't know how to fight back. For the first time in his life, he was numbed by the anesthetic of guilt. He was torn between rage and grief over what he'd done. I'm not going to be like you, he blurted. It's too late, his grown-up self answered. You've already done the things that made me what I am. Bentley yanked his arm free of Slally's hand. You're just trying to make me feel bad, he said. I wasn't afraid to fight. I got the stone back. I didn't give up. The contemptuous smile was still on the grown-up's face. You were driven on that journey by a guilt you couldn't acknowledge, he said. It, it was driven, um, I was driven by it for years and years. My mind had instantly wiped out the memory of the supreme crime. I haven't done any crimes. The mind can be made to forget, said the adult Bentley Ellicott. But the feeling won't go away. The torment of the act I had blotted out of the memory never let, out of memory never left me. You, the tyrannical child in me, shriveled my days with anxiety and filled my sleep with nightmares. I had to exercise you by facing the f and finding out the truth. It took years, doctors, drugs, confessions, and then finally I knew what I had done. Bentley clapped his hands over his ears so that he couldn't hear any more. But the condemning man before him spoke, also in the second air. His words hit Bentley like a bolt of lightning. You killed Helga. Slowly, Bentley lowered his hands. The wind, surrounded, uh, the wind sounded in his ears. The surf roared below him. Confusion was flooding his mind, breaking up his thoughts. Frantically, he tried to remember the morning Helga died. I was asleep, he whispered. I was sleeping when it happened. I used sleep to obliterate the knowledge of what I did at sunrise that day, his older self said. I willed myself to forget that I woke up scared just before dawn. I lived for more than half a century before I faced the fact that I had taken the stone into Helga's room, crying that I was afraid of it. She loved me, and she tried to comfort me, but I was full of cowardly panic. Helga took the stone from me and told me to watch from my bedroom window. I went back to my room and stood in the window as the sun was coming up. It was the color of gold and blood. I didn't, Bentley cried. I watched her go down the porch steps barefoot and walk across the lawn to the edge of the forest. She looked up at me at the window, smiling and showing me that she was going to take the path into the woods and throw away the stone. I saw her walk between the trees. I ran into the bathroom because from that window I could see her go down the path. I didn't, I didn't do it, Bentley screamed. I saw the bobcat in the clearing before she saw it, the middle-aged man continued his eyes gleaming at the pale, shaking boy before him. I saw it spring. I saw her cry out once as she went down. I saw the blood, the terrible animal, clawing and slashing at her. I couldn't stop watching. When the bobcat had torn apart her hand and grabbed the stone, my stone, I had only one thought. Good. The stone was gone. Nobody would ever know that I was the reason Helga went out there. I went back to bed. I was so horrified that I instantly blotted it all out with sleep. I made myself forget, dream, um, and forget and dream my selfish dreams.